Texas Math Mundo audience, I have in my hand my favorite all-time math book ever, Journey Through Genius by Dr. William Dunham. And today it's my extreme pleasure to uh, conduct an interview with the author of my all-time favorite book. How lucky am I? What's a special treat in store for me? And I hope to share this with the audience. Uh, let me take a moment and ask you that if you enjoy this sort of material, that you please uh, hit the subscription button and the notification bell, smash that like button, and leave a comment below. It really helps me out with the YouTube algorithm, and let's spread this content and this joy to as many people as possible. William Dunham, PhD, author of my favorite all-time math book, right ahead. My name is Saul Cantu, and this is Texas Math. Mundo. Texas Math Mundo audience, are we in store for a spectacular treat today? We have the author of my favorite all-time book, Journey Through Genius, in the house. He's a PhD from Ohio State, a historian of mathematics, who has authored four books on the subject, Journey Through Genius, The Mathematical Universe, Euler, The Master of Us All, and The Calculus Gallery. Most recently, he co-edited a volume, The G.H. Hardy Reader, published by Cambridge University Press, and he is featured in the Teaching Company's DVD course, Great Thinkers, Great Theorems. After retiring from Mullenberg College, he has, he has held visiting positions at Harvard, Princeton, Penn, Cornell, and Bryn Mawr, where he and his wife Penny currently are research associates in mathematics. And this is just a small sampling. I'm sure a full list of all his awards and honors would be as copious as the, as the works of Leonard Euler. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you, Saul. Thank you. Hey, uh, I can't tell you how happy I am. Can you imagine? I'm having a conversation with the author of my favorite all-time te math textbook. Man, I'm tickled. I'm, I'm so happy. So happy. Uh, so Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So let me start off by, uh, by asking, you know, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you handling the pandemic? Well, you know, like everybody, it's been uh, a little bit slow. Some of the plans we had were scrapped. I take a lot of walks. I've been walking lots. Uh, reading, um, but it'll be nice if life ever gets back to normal. Yeah, so how are you spending your time nowadays? You know, work, hobbies, interest? Well, um, I do some work in, in the sense of still writing about the history of math. Uh, if I find a little nugget or tidbit that looks like fun, I will write it up. Um, no books in the work, in the offing, just now, although you never know. Um, we, in retirement, we like to travel. We went to Europe and Australia and things like that. And of course that facet of life is gone while the pandemic is around. So it's just been more of a local kind of existence, but I've always enjoyed um, speaking. Occasionally I would get speaking invitations and then you get to go and meet people from, well, I've been in Houston, for instance, uh, at uh, Rice and University of Houston, and then you might go to California and you might go to Florida. And so that's great fun. But again, that's all been become virtual like this. You know, I, I, I get to talk to computer screens rather than see people in person. But, you know, compared to what it could be, we're, we're doing fine. <laughs> and, you know, uh, thanks to the beauty of YouTube, I have witnessed a couple of your extremely engaging, extremely ex inspiring speeches. In particular, I saw one that you gave at the History of a Mathematics Museum, and another I saw that you gave at Harvard. And wow, these are some exalted venues. So for you to come to my humble little YouTube channel and share your perspective, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. And what inspiring and engaging way you have about you when you speak at these venues. Well, thank you. I mean, when you're speaking to a big audience like those were, you know, you want to be engaging. You sort of have to be a bit of an entertainer. You know, you have to uh, understand the audience and what might elicit a good response. So, yeah, you, you practice that and you, you get a knack. Yeah. And you know what also helps? The amazing content of your speeches. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, it, 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 that's really the star of the show. If I'm talking about Euler, you know, Euler is the star, and I'm just conveying it as best I can. Awesome, awesome. So, you know, let me get a little insight into your brilliant brain and your brilliant uh, background. Uh, you know, where are you from, born and raised, and, you know, what is your cultural heritage? Um, I'm born in um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania. Uh, went to the University of Pittsburgh as an undergraduate and then to Ohio State for graduate school. Um, and uh, after I got, got the PhD, I got married. We had a family. We, I've taught at a few small liberal arts schools at a place called Hanover College in Indiana and Muhlenberg in Pennsylvania. The small liberal arts thing is pretty big out here in the East. You know, I guess you have um, like there's what Austin College and um, Southwestern, some Trinity, some smaller schools. But Texas, I think of as, you know, UT and big, big schools like Ohio State. But the kinds of places I taught most of my career were these schools of 1000 to 2000 students, which oh, is very, very nice. You know, you, you get to know your your students and the, and the teaching skills are critical at a place like that. You have to be effective. Um, so that's that's my academic career. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I have to ask, as you know, who were your inspirations as you were growing up and entering the mathematics uh, field and mathematical story? Who were your inspirations, uh, both in practical contemporary times, but also historically? Well, you know, if you look at the history of math, you run into some heroic figures, certainly. And, and as I got to know the math, I... I you know, you, you've got to admire Euclid. I don't know if if you teach, uh, you probably teach plane geometry, but, you know, that has such a foundation in what Euclid did in 300 BC, a very long time ago. And, and you meet Archimedes and then there's Newton. And if you saw my talk on Newton, a very problematic human being, but maybe the smartest person that ever lived, maybe. You know. And then Euler, not now, now they're inspirations in the sense that I admire them. I do not pretend that I'm going to, you know, equal them or anything of that sort. It'd be like, um, I'm, in, uh, I'm inspired by Kareem, but I'm not going to practice enough basketball ever to be as good as him. But, but it's nice to have people to look up to. And, and those are some of them from a more modern, um, perspective. I don't know how much you or your students know about Bertrand Russell, but he's a, a real fan. I mean, I'm a real fan of his. He's a, he was a mathematician, a philosopher, a social critic, an anti-war fighter. He went to jail um, during World War I because he didn't think Britain should be fighting that war, and he was a prisoner of conscience. Uh, he was sort of a libertine as a person, but he ended up winning the Nobel Prize for Literature the first and I predict last mathematician whoever will win the Nobel Prize for Literature. So if, if you want a really colorful, cantankerous guy you want to read about, go check out Bertrand Russell. He's, he's an inspiration. Is he the gentleman that was contemplating suicide? But Yes, that's right. Yes, until he read Euclid, right? That <laughs> saved him, right? Wow, that's, what's <laughs> that's what he said. Now, you can't always take him uh, at face value. Russell liked to kid. Um, in his autobiography, uh, he was he lived to be 98 or something. And he's, so he's 92, and he hasn't written his autobiography yet. People said, don't you think you might want to hurry up and start working on this? He said, well, maybe, but... He says, what if something great happens? He says, what if I should become the president of Mexico? I would hate not to include that in my autobiography. <laughs> and, so, uh, for the audience's benefit, uh, do, you know, do you know that uh, suicide story in any detail? Not much more than you said. He, he, uh, he, yeah, until he learned his mathematics, he, he had had a troubled childhood. His parents had died young. He'd been raised by his grandfather, who happened to be the prime minister you know, of England. So one thing about Russell is he was um, royal or noble, I guess, you know, in his background. He, he remembered sitting on the knee of Queen Victoria when he was a kid. She came to visit. So there's this little baby, Bertrand, bouncing on the knee of Queen Victoria. And yet by the time he died, Neil Armstrong had walked on the moon. Wow. That's quite a life, you know, wow. to see those um, wow. alpha and omega. 
but no, he, he thought that uh, when he was down, the mathematics pulled him out of his uh, depression. So, you know, for my students, it's the opposite. Uh, you know, mathematics drives them to suicide. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or maybe I do. I don't know if it's the mathematics or me, but whatever. <laughs> so, so, you know, I can only imagine how lucky a student is to have had you as a professor. Can you describe your years as a college professor? Uh, what did you teach? How would you describe your life as a professor? Well, you know, at a small college, a liberal arts school, uh, you can't just specialize in one thing. You know, if you're at Texas A&M or Baylor or something, you might just only teach your specialty. But um, at, at Hanover and Muhlenberg, you, you had to teach the whole range of math courses from introductory statistics, calculus, one, two, you know, analysis. You got some more uh, specialized things, but it was sort of all over the map as all my colleagues did the same. We, we were sort of generalists, but the um, the course that I developed and most enjoyed was the history of math. And at uh, those two small colleges, I had a course on, I think I called it landmarks of Greek mathematics. So we spent a whole semester on, you know, Euclid and Archimedes and Hippocrates and Heron. And, and then I had one called landmarks of modern mathematics, which started with Cardano and went up to Cantor, kind of like journey through genius. It was split in half. That was great fun. Now, it, after I retired, and I had these visiting opportunities. Then I would only do history. You know, then I was the specialist and, you know, even a great, great school like Harvard or Princeton didn't have anybody that much wanted to teach the history of math, you know, they, they thought they should have this, but they didn't know it. And so they said, you know, would you like to come and uh, do this? And I said, yes, I will come and do this. And so I, I had my little uh, niche, I guess, that I could fill and uh, help them out. And, and uh, of course, students don't get any better than Harvard and Princeton. And, you know, it, it was quite amazing to see so that. Awesome. So awesome. So awesome. Any uh, memorable moments uh, from your teaching career? Well, um, the, the uh, let me tell two Harvard stories. Uh, the, the second time I was there, one of my best students was this woman who, uh, she was a math concentrator is what they call it at Harvard, not major. Uh, but she also wrote poetry. So she then went to Cambridge and did a master's of philosophy and then came back to Harvard. She's finishing her PhD. But in the meantime, she publishes a highly acclaimed book of poetry. So here, this is like Bertrand Russell, you know, he could write and he could do math. Well, Zoe could do um, math and econ and history of science. And she was a poet. And then the second time I was at Harvard, one of my best students was this woman that she came out of nowhere at the first week and she said she's in law school. She's finishing up Harvard Law, you know, but she always loved math. Could she take this course, which there I was teaching a course on Euler. It was much more focused just on Euler. And I said, well, you know, how, you know, is your math fresh? No, she hasn't really seen math for years, but she always loved it. Can I, shouldn't she do it? So I said, okay, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Well, she ends up being the best student in the course, even among these math wizards, you know. So I figured that, you know, she she was on the turn time. She was on the law review at Harvard. She then went off the clerk for some important just judge somewhere. And I, I want her to be my lawyer someday, you know, this sort of thing. So, you know, those kind of things you remember when you run into a student of that, that caliber and, and that both very interesting people, you know, not not just focused only on math, but having the poetry and the law and other things going for them. They're just uh, people that are going to make a difference in this world. In the coming century, I, I'm sure. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, how did you develop your fascination, your interest in the history of mathematics? Well, um, I, I never took a course on it. Uh, when I was in high school, I was either going to go off and study math or history. These had both been my two greatest interests. And, uh, you know, people said, oh, do math, you know, don't do history. It's nothing, you know, it's easier to get a job with math. So I did math. And, and for my undergraduate and then graduate career, it was just pretty much math, math, math. I, I, my PhD was in topology. It wasn't in the history of anything. But all the way along, I was sort of curious, where did this come from? You know, I mean, there, there was no topology in the 17th century, and there was topology in the 20th century, and something happened, but I didn't know what it was. And 
So then I went, as I say, to this small liberal arts college where you're a generalist. And if you had this specialty in graduate school, it pretty much dissipates. You know, you don't have anyone to talk to in your particular area. Um, the school I was at was a school of 1,100 students, and it was 50 miles to the next school. It was in rural Indiana. So I could sort of feel my academic um, chops, you know, disintegrating. I was spending time doing other things, but I wasn't thinking about math, and I needed some kind of rejuvenation. And that's when I remembered history. You know, I really loved history, and I really did kind of want to know where these ideas came from. So I started reading. And as I did, I found that I liked the history of math more than just the math, you know, that not only do you get to meet these interesting people and put the math in context, but the original proofs of someone like Euclid, you know, or, or Newton or Euler, to actually read them and see what these people really did was just awesome. I, I used this in, in that Harvard talk you watched. Uh, if somebody told you Van Gogh was a great painter, but never showed you the painting, you know, you'd believe them, I guess, but it isn't the same experience. So if, if I tell you Euler is a great mathematician, I should really show you something he did. And then you can see why that reputation is so uh, apt. So it was a, kind of a, just a sort of an early career change of course, where I reached into my past and pulled back that history that I always loved and fused it with math. And then some magic happened and I, I got, uh, got a few breaks Awesome. With Journey Through Genius, actually. Well, I'm sure you earned those breaks, you know, with your hard work <laughs> and dedication, you know. Uh, so what are your, uh, can you say, what are, like, what are your favorite episodes from the history of mathematics? Well, um, I'll tell you two. I mean, one would just be anything Euler did. <laughs> so he's my, he's my uh, hero in that sense. Um, he was history's most prolific mathematician, uh, his collected works cover over 25,000 pages. One person, he, and these weren't joint papers, he would just do them himself. So, you know, it, it, today, if you retired and you had published 250 pages of original math, that would be a great career. And he did a hundred times that, <laughs> you know, um, so that the, it, it takes shelves and shelves in a library just to have his collected works, you know, unpublished form. And in there, you'll find so many amazing things that he did from um, analysis to algebra to number theory to geometry, even geometry, you know, which by the seventh or the 18th century, you'd think it would have been all done, you know, that Euclid would have figured out all the geometry or Archimedes, but there were still geometrical things that were, that he was discovering. Wow. So he, you know, he's one of my favorites. Um, and wasn't he blind for half of those papers? Yes, he lost vision in one eye um, when he was in his 30s, and that did not stop his output. And then he went blind when he was in his, what, 60s. He lost vision in the other eye, and that didn't stop his output. Um, so as, as I like to say, he's sort of the Beethoven of mathematics. Beethoven went deaf and could still write music, and Euler went blind, but he still published. Um, you know, he would do a paper a week, while he was blind. Um, yeah, so, you know, if you're looking for an inspiration, not just because of the output, but because of the obstacles he had to overcome, you, you won't do better than Euler. Wow, wow, wow. And, you know, uh, just in the book, Journey Through Jesus itself, you share some magnificent, uh, elegant, uh, incredibly beautiful uh, proofs of the theorems. Do you have a particular favorite one? Anyone that's particularly elegant, particularly beautiful? <laughs> well, the Basel problem is, is certainly a highlight. This is where uh, this problem had a history. So, okay, history of math. So, uh, Johann Bernoulli had challenged the world to figure out the sum of this infinite series. One plus a fourth plus a ninth plus a 16th, uh, you're, you're taking the reciprocals of the squares and adding them up forever. And Johann knew, we would say, in our terminology, it converged. And he knew that sum was less than two, but he wanted the exact answer and he couldn't get it. And he challenged the mathematical community to find this and nobody could until Euler as a young person. In fact, this was his first big splash. He figured it out. 
Um, and the proof is so amazing. It's like, you know, breathtaking almost. But the answer is one plus a fourth plus a ninth plus a sixteenth plus a twenty-fifth. The sum of the reciprocals of the squares forever and ever is pi squared over six. Wow. Um, yeah, and even to this day, that doesn't make any sense. It looks like a typo, right? Pi squared over six. How could that be? But then you read Euler's proof, and sure enough, it's pi squared over six. So, so that's a great proof if you if you like analysis and symbols. Let me give one other. If you like just sort of the pure logic of it, there, there's uh, the proof of the infinitude of primes from Euclid, Book Nine, where he shows that there's infinitely many primes by showing that any finite batch of primes can be augmented. So if you give him any finite collection of primes, he'll find a prime that isn't there. And that means no finite group could corral them all. There's infinitely many. But his argument is just a glorious piece of reasoning. It has very little that's sophisticated background. You don't need many prerequisites, I guess I should say. Uh, as opposed to Euler's proof of the Basel problem, where you got to know what sines and cosines are and things like that. Euclid's working in a much more uh, elementary time, and yet the proof is is the gold standard of all proofs, probably. The infinitude of primes. What is that? Chapter three of Journey Through Genius. Wow, wow. Is that a by way of contradiction proof? It, it, um, there's there's a, a little contradiction in one of his cases, but his proof is, is by cases. Oh, um, wow. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, it's, it's glorious. G.H. Hardy said it was the litmus test for someone interested in math. If somebody said, I'm interested in math, Hardy would show them Euclid's proof of the infinitude of primes. And if they were indifferent to this proof, then Hardy would say, don't study math. You're not ready for it. You know, go sell vacuum cleaners or do something else, but go away. Whereas if you were interested and you were excited by that proof, then maybe math was your future. So. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. You know, I remember hearing you say something about Euler that he gives you the sensation after reading his logic that you could have thought about that. But you don't say that's yeah. not true. <laughs> right. He makes a point of explaining it in his writings, what he's thinking. Sometimes he even tells you where he went wrong, which wow. doesn't happen anymore. You know, people don't want to let that out. But yeah, when you're all done, you say, well, yeah, I could have figured that out. No, you would never have figured it out. But the... Wow. Wow. That's so awesome. Such incredible beauty there. Such incredible beauty. So your books are works of art, man. I was inspired by this book. When I read it, I was just so inspired. So I'm kind of curious, what was the, and this is your first book, correct? Yes, that's right. So what was the genesis of the idea? Well, it, it, uh, it was a bunch of uh, improbables, I think. Um, you know, as I said, I was at Hanover, I was interested in doing something different. I got interested in history and, um, a uh, grant proposal came around in the state of Indiana from the Lilly Endowment. That, that's a, a big, uh, rich funding group. And they said, if you're a teacher in a college in Indiana and there's a course you would like to teach for which there is no textbook, so you'd have to prepare it from scratch, we'll fund you for a summer of research to get it ready. So I thought, well, you know, I'm sort of interested in history. We could do a, I could do a course on the great theorems. You know, the, to, the analogy would be a course on the great novels or the great paintings, you know. It wasn't supposed to be encyclopedic. It wasn't supposed to study every corner of history, but you just take a selection of something from Euclid and something from Archimedes and something from Newton, and that would be my course. So I took it to the dean and I said, I'd like to apply for this grant. And the dean said, they'll never fund that. You know, nah, I'll never do that. But he had a sign off on it. So he did. And lo and behold, I got the grant. Wow. So the Lillian Dalman said, prepare such a course. So, um, so that was one improbable that worked. So I prepared the course. I spent a summer reading intensely from Euclid and Newton and everything. Taught the course. It was great fun. I loved it. And I taught it again which you had to do. Actually, that was part of the grant. Well, they would only give you the money if you'd actually teach the class. If wow. you just took the money and didn't teach it, you had to give it back. So, so I taught the course. And I had such fun with it. I thought, I'll write a little article about this for a journal called the American Mathematical Monthly and just tell people if they're interested on the, what this great theorems course was like. So I published this article and uh, I get a phone call and it's from an editor at John Wiley Publishers 
And she said she saw this paper and thought there might be a book there, you know, that I could take this and turn it into a book. And I said, I don't write books. You know, I read books. I don't, I never wrote a book. How do you do this? She said, no, you really should do it. I, I was hesitant to agree. So she said, write a sample chapter. And that'll, that'll be my test. So I wrote the chapter about Cardano and the solution of the cubic equation, um, which is, a, is an amazing story, right? It, it, it's got these most bizarre characters from uh, uh, 16th century Italy. It's got a great challenge and a, an amazing theorem, which frankly, until I had started doing this work for the course, I didn't even know there was a formula to solve third degree equations as a kind of cousin to the quadratic formula for second degree equations. So, so I wrote up the chapter and I sent it to John Wiley publishers and they sent me a contract. They said, write a book. So now I signed the contract and now I had to write a book. So, you know, I could have not gotten the grant from Lily. I could have hung up the phone from Wiley and none of this would have happened. So I was, I'm glad of course, in retrospect that I tried Sometimes you try things and they don't work, but it, you know, if you don't try things, <laughs> they certainly won't work. So um, uh, I sometimes remember the quotation from Alexander Graham Bell, who said that, you know, when you're walking along a path, occasionally jump into the woods. He, he said, dive into the woods. Maybe you'll see something new. Now, maybe it won't work and you'll get lost or you'll get ticks or something, but maybe you'll find a new wonderful thing. And I dived into the woods on those occasions and got journey through genius out of it. And then the other books followed from that, but that was, that was the, the origin of this. And it was uh, amazing. It's still, you know, my favorite in that sense. It, it was the one that got everything going. Well, I'm very thankful that all those things fell into place, man. Because, <laughs> uh, and actually, uh, I actually recommend this to all my students also, because it's such a beautiful Good. work. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And, and I think it's, you know, your students can understand it, right? That's the thing. It's, uh, that one, they told me to write that for the scientifically literate reader. That was my audience. Uh, what they said is somebody that could understand scientific America, okay. but not calculus based. It wasn't supposed to be that high. So there's a, hardly any calculus in there. It's just trig and algebra and geometry. And, and yet there's, I think, plenty of classics in there, you know, from awesome. math history. Awesome. Awesome. That must have ignited a fire because there was books to follow. Oil is the master <laughs> of us all, the calculus gallery, the mathematical universe. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the next one was the mathematical universe from um, also Wiley. And th there they wanted me to lower the level. So the, instead of the scientifically educated reader, this was for the educated reader. <laughs> so it has uh, less math. In. Um, in fact, some of the chapters are just um, all text. There's no math at all. There's a, a chapter I, I, I talk about the, the mathematical personality, you know, and I have a chapter about women in mathematics. And, and in those chapters, it's just writing. It's just history. Um, after that, then I cranked it up a level for the Euler book from, that was from the MAA, the Math Association. And that one does have calculus as an expectation. And then the calculus gallery from Princeton was the most sophisticated of the four. It has a lot of analysis in it. You really want to be a, probably a, have majored in math in college or at least minored in it to plunge into that one. So there's different levels and, you know, it's important when you're writing or speaking to know who your audience is and, you know, have a vision of where you're pitching this. You don't want to pitch it too high or too low for the audience that they have in mind. Awesome. Awesome. I should say one other thing about journey through genius, since you held it up a few times, sure. the title, that wasn't my title. Um, I, I had wanted to call it the great theorems of mathematics, you know, and, the people at Wiley said, no, no, that's not catchy enough. You need something catchier. And uh, I didn't know what that meant, but they were the marketing experts. So they said, how about journey through genius? And I hated it. I said, what? What does that even mean? Journey through genius. What are you talking about? They said, no, no, trust us. This will be a good title. <laughs> so they put the title on because the publisher owns the title. You know, they can call it whatever they want. And um, it worked. You know, that, that cut people's eye. Um so I, I understand they're the experts. <laughs> hey, well, I'm so happy. It's, it's a beautiful stuff. 
Uh, I do want to get a little bit, uh, can you comment on the creative process and the journey of an author? Is it just many, many hours of isolation? Yeah, I, I would, um, you know, try to write most mornings. Usually, I, I couldn't do it all day. You'd get tired, but, you know, I'd, I'd come in and have my coffee, read my New York Times, you know, and then go in and just be in a, usually in a cubicle in a library for two, three, four hours. And when I emerged for lunch, then when I went back, I would revise the previous day's stuff, but I wasn't trying to be, you know, creative. Uh, I had, I was tired of that. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you revise and then you revise the revision and then you revise the revised document. And, you know, I would go through nine, 10, 12 drafts of a book, you know, tens of thousands of pages sitting there and you end up throwing them all away until you finally get to a manuscript that you're ready to submit. And, you know, and, and journey through genius that took seven or eight months to, wow. to get to that point. And then I sent it off and that was my first book. And I thought, I'm done, you know, there, I said, no. but you're not, you're half done because what happens after you send the, the manuscript is <laughs> just as onerous that, you know, they, they send it back with their edits, you know, and, and I was very fortunate that my editors were very good and the things they suggested made it much better. Oh, wow. So then you fix that and then you send that in and then they send back the galleys, you know, the page proofs. And you have to go over and make sure that in the print, everything came out like you wanted it. Then you have to write copy for the dust jacket and for the advertising. And uh, then you have to do the index. And, you know, months wow. and months, another year basically gets consumed with that sort of detritus, you know, the stuff that came after the really creative part, but nonetheless is important. So believe me, whenever you're done, it's the closest a man can come to having a baby, you know, I mean, it's like full immersion. And, and then finally the book comes in the box someday, you know, and there it is. And then you feel that it's all been worth it. But before you plunge into that next one, you know, you, you have to think, am I ready for this? This is not, not trivial, but it, it's like the, the, the biggest term paper you ever wrote times a hundred, you know, that sort of thing. But, but again, it, you, you get a feeling of uh, satisfaction when it's done. Wow, that's just some great insight into the journey of an author. That's just some great insight. I was going to ask, um, so since you're a mathematical historian, what has history taught us about the, the nature of uh, mathematical genius? Nature or nurture? Mm. Well, you know, that's one of those questions where the answer is yes. You know, <laughs> yeah. Nature or nurture, yes. So, um, you know, you can't even imagine how many great mathematicians didn't become great mathematicians because they did not have the nurturing. They did not have the environment. Um, so many people that did make it were, were fortunate either by being wealthy uh, or be, you know, having um, a patron that would support them. Uh, Newton, remember, was such a strange character that they didn't know what to do with him. You know, he couldn't be a farmer. He couldn't be a clergyman. So they just sent him to university where he happened to, blossom you know into this extraordinary genius but if if um the nurturing is bad I mean, and and there one thinks of women you know for for so many centuries who weren't even allowed to go to school how many great mathematicians might have emerged except for the the nurturing ceiling that was put upon them on the other hand there's got to be a, a natural what proclivity among some of these people newton would be so passionate about his math, you know, that he would not eat, he would not sleep, he would not move, he would just sit there and work all night. And, um, you know, how many people do that? That's a gift, you know, to have that kind of ability to concentrate for hours and hours and hours and push the frontier like that. So, you know, the uh, the great ones have, have both. I don't know if your students know the story of Ramanujan, the great Indian mathematician from the early 20th century who, didn't have the, the nurturing at all. He was from Madras, as it was then called in India, but he had the gift, that's for sure. And, and he taught himself mathematics and then became this incandescent genius, burst on the scene and um, ended up at Cambridge with G.H. Hardy and uh, did a, amazing things. It's still like fiction almost to read the story of this person that came out of nowhere and did so much. 
And my understanding is that he's lucky that G.H. Hardy paid attention to his letters. Yes. He had sent letters to other people and, and they just threw them away, you know, because they didn't know who this is. Somebody writing from India, you know, just toss it. And Hardy read it. The story was Hardy read the letter and put it aside. He was thinking of tossing it out too, but he's, he thought about it and decided that there must be something right about this letter because the results were so weird. <laughs> they were too weird to be made up. And, and so he went back and he showed his colleague Littlewood and they started working on it. And they realized that whoever sent this letter was a genius of the first order. And, and they brought Ramanujan to Cambridge. There's a movie called The Man Who Knew Infinity. I don't know, Saul, if you've seen that, but uh, that's about that story with um, Jeremy Irons playing Hardy and Dev Patel playing Ramanujan. And uh, anyone watching this should uh, stop watching this and go watch The Man Who Knew Infinity because it's the best math movie I've ever seen. And, and some amazing you... stories, aren't they? Some amazing stories. Yeah, right. Wow. And you wouldn't get that if you didn't, you know, look into the history of the subject. You just could read the theorem, but it's neat to know what was behind it. Yes, yes. So what lessons do you hope are imparted uh, upon people that read your works? I, I hope, you know, they enjoy it, that, that, that they see it not just as something useful, although some of these theorems are useful, but, but something that is sort of artistic, you know, that... Uh, that's one of the things Bertrand Russell would always talk about, that the that, that mathematics is this great art form. If, if you, now, granted, you have to understand, you know, what cosines and sines are, and there's a lot of prerequisites. But once you get to that point, you can see some real intellectual beauty in these things. Um, Russell called mathematics the arena where pure thought can dwell as in its natural home. Oh. And it's where, you know, pure thought, it's, because it's, the math is really just here, you know, it's, it's in your head. It, it, you can draw a triangle, but what you're thinking of is the ideal triangle and the ideal line and the prime numbers. And to be able to manipulate these things and come up with fascinating results, like that one series goes to pi squared over six, or there's infinitely many primes. That's as great a piece of art, I would say, as Moby Dick, you know, or Michelangelo's David. Beautiful message. You know, uh, because of the nature of my channel, a lot of high school students will watch this. And uh, I tell them, you know, I don't care if you're doing mathematics in a ghetto school, a barrio school, or at Harvard University. The math is the math is the math. Equally yeah. beautiful. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of high school students uh, hopefully, uh, you know, come across this channel because of the nature of the channel. I want to ask, what advice, what sort of insight uh, would you like to, uh, to give to them as they embark upon their own journey of mathematical discovery? Well, you know, um, read a lot. You, you, you specialize in contests down in Texas, right? And those, those are fun. And, um, you know, follow your, your passion and your interest. Don't get discouraged. This stuff is hard, you know, as, as some people point out. It's, there's, there's some subjects where everything is superficial, it seems. And then there's math, and you have to work at it. And sometimes you don't get it. Newton um, reported that when, when he first read the work of Descartes, his predecessor, he could only get a few lines in and he'd get lost. Wow. What did he do? He went back and started over. And this time he got a little further mm -hmm. before he got lost. And then he'd go back and go further and said, finally, he mastered it all. You know? But he, it, it takes perseverance. And if Newton could have trouble, <laughs> you know, think about the rest of us. So, um, but, you know. I would say, you know, if there's a, a a tough subject or an idea that isn't coming, you know, sleep on it, but don't give up because as you push along, doors open to other mathematics. And then, of course, math being so incredibly useful to other fields, to statistics and computers and economics and all of those doors will open if you persevere in the math. So keep at it. It's, it's, a, it's worth it. Awesome, awesome. And many of those uh, lessons from history are pertinent today. You know, yeah. and especially with my kids stuck on their cell phones half the class period. <laughs> wow. Yeah, Newton didn't use his cell phone very much. <laughs> Funny. So the next question maybe perhaps is a little premature. You look awesome. You look great. Uh, but I did want to ask, you know, you are retired. I was going to ask a question about legacy. You know, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, your works are true joys. 
you know, what do you think, uh, what would you hope that your legacy will be? <laughs> well, um, it would be nice if there were people like Saul, you know, that had that feeling about it for a, a long time. It is comforting, I don't know what the word is, satisfying to know that when you write a book, you know, it's it's still going to be there even uh, when you aren't. And likewise with the uh, the DVD course I did the uh, for the teaching company, that, that, that was sort of like Journey Through Genius on video. And, you know, that'll be around. And, um, and the math is going to be just as good 100 years from now as it is today. So I, ho I hope people will look at it and enjoy it. Absolutely. You're right. It's timeless. It's timeless. Yeah, right. And generations upon generations are going to enjoy the fruits of your labor, man. Let me tell you. That's oh, I hope so. And, you know, it's, it was nice of Euclid and Euler not to write anything new after I did those <laughs> books. You know, so. <laughs> funny, funny, funny. All right. So uh, what does the future hold for author William Dunham, Ph.D.? Well, you know, I... I hope I can get back into a, a retirement mode of traveling places. Uh, Penny and I want to go to France and England. You know, we, we lived in England for six months at Cambridge, and that was the experience of a lifetime. What an amazing place that is. Wow. Um, I occasionally write up little articles uh, still on, on mathematics, and uh, I hope I continue that, whether that will ever become another book or just articles or just something that I share with a few colleagues, I don't know, but but I, I do try to keep active in that sense. So, wow, who knows? <laughs> so, any parting words or final thoughts as we conclude this interview? Um, no, I think I've said a lot. I certainly thank you for this, and hope hope the students of Texas and other people that uh, watch your channel uh, have enjoyed it. The pleasure is all mine. The pleasure is all mine. Let me tell you, it was the birthday of a, of a colleague that I admire and respect at work uh, recently. And I was thinking about a gift to give them. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to give them my favorite all-time math book. And so that started a chain of mental associations. They're like, well, you know, why don't I contact this guy? Maybe he'll give me an interview. And sure enough, the stars aligned. And I cannot thank you enough, man. I can't thank you enough. Um, I know you're in the East, uh, Northeast, uh, but if you ever happen to find yourself in these parts, in, in this neck of the woods, I would hope that you might consider uh, contacting me. I know some good taquerias around Houston. You know what I'm saying? It would be wonderful to, uh, to treat yeah, you that would be fun. something like that. Yeah. Or even, yeah, visit a school or something. That... Oh, absolutely. Universities yeah. are beautiful places, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's the only place to be. <laughs> well, I can tell you, the impact of your work has been incredible. It's inspiring for generations to come. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Uh, thank you so very much. Well, thank you, Saul. I appreciate it. Farewell, farewell. Bye-bye. Wow, what an incredible gentleman. That was, a, that was a pure treat for me. William Dunham, Ph.D., author of my favorite textbook of all time, Journey Through Genius. Uh, and that was such an incredible treat, and I'm so uh, thankful to have him on this show. Thanks very much. All right, so let me take a moment and remind you that if you like this sort of material, please hit the subscription button and the notification bell, smash that like button, and leave a comment below. It helps me out with the YouTube algorithm. Let's spread this beauty and this joy to as many people as possible. Thank you very much. I have plenty of wonderful stuff in, ahead in store for this channel. Uh, thank you for your support. My name is Saul Cantu.